I want to um, walk you through, um, just review briefly what we've been sharing last week, and then I'm going to move through this passage that's in front of you, um, just to share some principles and concepts out of this, and four things I want to share from the text to kind of challenge us as we are on this issue of discipleship. And just to let you know, we're going to be here um, for a while as we flesh out this issue of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Now, I need you to repeat after me. Say, Lord, Lord help, me to be a help me to be a radical disciple. Yeah, come on, say it again. Say, Lord, Lord. help me to be a radical disciple. Help me to be a radical. Amen, amen. Now, let me talk through this a little bit, and then we can allow God to be God. So here's what we talked about briefly last week is that we looked at the issue of what a uh, disciple is. And as we talked about the biblical history of foundation as it relates to the concept of discipleship, number one, we found out that we are called to be in relationship with God. Now, that's a very, very important concept that I, I need to hash out so we can, it can get in our spirits, get in our hearts, that God loves you, God loves me, and he pursues a loving relationship with us, okay? So the whole thing about discipleship is God chasing you to be like him. Does that make sense? And he does because he loves you and he wants us to be in relationship with him. And we saw this in his pursuit of the Old Testament saints. We saw this in his pursuit as it relates to the New Testament in incarnating himself to allowing his son to be on the earth. And we also saw this in how when he left the earth, he sent his spirit to reside within us so that we can be the image or we can, those of us who bear the image of God in the earth can tell the world about a loving Savior. Okay, so then we found out that what discipleship means, it's just simply the process of devoting oneself to a, a teacher to learn from and to become more like them. Now, I'm going to say that again because I'm going to spend some time talking through that a little bit this morning from this parable. Discipleship is the process of devoting oneself to be like a teacher or to be Jesus, to, um, to devote to Jesus, to learn from and to become more like them. So here's how I'm going to summarize this. Discipleship is becoming like Christ. Okay? So say that. Say discipleship is becoming like Christ. Say it. Come on, one more time. Say it, say it again. Say it. Discipleship is becoming like Christ. That's very, very important that we not miss this. So out of all the Hebrew words and of all the Greek words that I showed you last week, we're going to spend a little bit of time on this particular word here um, in not only, we won't deal with it so much today, but I'm going to deal with the concept, and in the upcoming weeks, we'll be talking about this a lot, right? It's the Greek word akolutheo, and what it really means is to follow, or figuratively refers to the process of following someone as a disciple, Okay, so in the upcoming weeks, you're gonna, I'm going to show you in Scripture Jesus using this word over and over and over again because you're going to hear him say, follow me, follow me, follow me. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're going to hear him say that, so I'm going to flesh that out so we can get to where God would have us to go. So here is the big idea that I want you to take away, um, and this is harsh, it's hard, and I, I, I don't want to have to apologize for God's word, but God is calling us to hard commitments. Y'all all right with that? Amen. He's calling us to hard commitments. So I'm, I'm going to try to be as loving as I can um, this morning and in the upcoming weeks because um, I don't know that we fully understand what discipleship is, what we signed up for, so I'm going to flesh that out a little bit. So here's what the big idea says, right? Discipleship is costly, it's costly, it demands total surrender, and this word of other allegiances to make Jesus absolute priority in our lives. And this was from last week's text, I'm using the same idea in subsequent weeks to kind of talk about, Right? It's expensive to be a disciple. It calls for me to give up other allegiances. It calls for total surrender to make Christ a priority in my life. Does that make sense? You guys are all right with me? Okay, so let's go to work. Grab your Bibles, open to the book of Luke, 
And let's walk through this. And I'm going to share four simple things with you using as many illustrations as I can along the way to drive home the, the point of discipleship. Now, when you get to the book of Luke in chapter 14, at the onset of this chapter, Jesus had received an invitation to go to a home of a Pharisee for dinner. And if you know Jesus, whenever you invite him to dinner, you invited the Son of God or God himself, and whenever he has opportunity to preach or to teach, he's going to seize that moment to preach or teach a little bit. So while he's at the dinner table, he's sharing with the individuals that are there. He is teaching. He's doing his thing within the home. And then at the end of the dinner invitation, the scene changes, and Jesus finds himself in a different place. Now, before I read the text and before I go into it, let me say this by way of introduction. The concept of discipleship is not a foreign concept in the earth. Let me just say that. Because a lot of us hear discipleship and we think it's a spiritual term. It's only about the Bible and it it only has biblical nuances. But I want to show you just before we go into the text that the concept of discipleship transcends or it, it even exists outside the biblical norm. Here's what we said on Wednesday. If anyone here is part of a fraternal uh, organization, be it a fraternity or a sorority, you ought to understand a little bit of what discipleship is. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. Here's what it looks like. Before you join that organization, there is a process that you have to go through to become a member. Come on, y'all. You know this. Y'all know this, right? And, and, and for those that's been in college or those that have my pledge, be it whatever your fraternity or sorority is, there's what's known as a hazing process or there's a pre-process that they take you through. And the purpose of that process is to strip you of who you are to make you into what you need to be to function in the organization. Y'all know this. Come on, y'all. Come on. Don't say amen if y'all know this. And, 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 and what I like about that process, even with the fraternity and the sorority, is that they even assign, I'm going to use words so we can connect the dots, a discipler to disciple you. Yeah, y'all know how this works. So when you join and you are on a new line for transferring over, there's a person that's ahead that's supposed to teach you all the traits to bring you through. Okay? I mean, it's no different than the military. When you join military, here's what happens. They call it basic training. Yeah. A lot of military people here, so you know about this, right? And, and all basic training is, it's a discipleship process to strip you of who you are, to make you a follower of an organization, and they teach you how to function in the thing and to become like the organization that you're committing to. Oh, yeah, come on now. Same thing. They too assign a discipler to disciple you. Matter of fact, my experience when I joined the military, my discipler met me the moment I got off the bus. Oh, come on now. I, I, y'all, some of y'all met the same fella, all right? And the moment I got off the bus, it's like, boy, you came all the way from there to do, you know, and just got to yelling all. I'm like, Lord Jesus, I don't know if I want to do this. <laughs> But then the process began. I mean, back then they cut all my hair off. And to show you how rebellious I was, I grew it all back, you know, because I didn't want to cut off. Then I got old and I cut it off anyway. <laughs> but, but, but the point was, is they were shaping me and stripping me of my former identity. So listen to the word, so I can conform to the dictates of the military. They discipled me. Are you with me? And here's how this looked. And the longer I stayed in, the more I looked like my uncle. Yeah, y'all know his name. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Right? (laughs) And so you wonder why it is now that folk that spent 20 years and 30 years, they live right next to a military base when they retire? Ah, y'all get it now. Yeah, yeah. Because you've been discipled, and it's become your life. It's become who you are. Come on. And they, come on, talk to me this morning. 
Yeah. So here's what you need. There's a cost associated with discipleship. And my concern with the church that I know of the world is before we sign up, we assess the cost. We process what it's going to cost to get in. But when it comes to Christianity, we sign up without counting the cost. Yeah, we do, we do, we do. Before I joined the military, I checked out the Marines, and I said, too expensive. I checked out the Army, I said, too expensive. And I checked out the Navy. Anyway, I checked out the Air Force. <laughs> and I said, I can do that. That's not expensive, because you don't have to spend 30 days in the wilderness, and you're not on the front line shooting guns. All, right. All you do is you stay in your office, and you send your pilots to fight for you. So I'm going to do this. Yeah, I said, I'm going to do this. Yeah. <laughs> So I counted the cost before I signed up. The concern with Christianity is we don't do that. We sign up, and then on the journey, we find out what the real cost is. Yeah. And so what we want to do when we find out what the cost is, we try to get an honorable discharge. But the thing about this, this, this God's army is that there's no discharge papers. Yeah, he's just going to keep conforming and conforming and conforming until we become like him. So it's very, very expensive. It's very, very expensive. So I just want to share, I want to share this text that's in front of us just for a few minutes. We won't be long so we can hear what it's saying. So notice how the text begins. Jesus, right after this dinner, he says this, verse 25, Now great crowds accompany him, and he turned to them and he said, If any man comes after me, and does not, look at the word he used, hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. And then he says, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus, this is harsh. Come on, y'all, say it's harsh. It's, it's okay to say that. It's harsh. So he, here's four things I want to share with you as it relates to discipleship. Number one, and then we'll talk about the text. Radical discipleship calls for us to reprioritize our personal life to follow Jesus. It calls for a reprioritization of our personal lives to follow Jesus. Look at how the text begins, right? Verse 26. If anyone, and then he uses the word, comes after me, right? So it's the Greek word erkomai that's used there. And what that word literally means is that a person, if you're going to come after, um, you must leave where you are to go where the person you're following is located. Okay? I like the fact that he didn't say go after him, but he says come after, implying that Jesus is positioned somewhere and he is extending a call. And when we make the decision, we must leave where we are to go to where Jesus is. Does this make sense? This is why I often say with discipleship, you cannot stay where you are and go where Jesus is. It calls for a shift, okay? Then here's the interesting word that he used. If you're going to come to him, um, the requirement is, is that we must do some hating, okay? Now this word hate, it's a very, very interesting word in that it could mean to detest, it could mean to despise, it could mean to be condescending, it could mean all that stuff. But from a, a Semitic perspective, what the word literally means, or what it's, it's a metaphor, and it's used metaphorically to mean to love less. Okay? To love less. Come on, say love less. Love say it again, say love less. Okay, so now notice how Jesus says it, okay? If you're going to leave where you are and go to where I am, there are certain things that you must love less, okay? And then he enumerates what they are. He says, our father, okay? He says, our mother. Then he says, our wife. He says, our children. He says, our brothers and sisters. And then he says, yes even your own life, okay? Now, what's striking about this is that he says, if you're not willing to do that, you cannot be my disciple, okay? Now, I don't know. Now, let me, let me just go straight here since I'm on the concept 
of military examples and so on and so forth. Here is what I learned about discipleship in the military. Their request is no different than this. Here's how, y'all probably didn't notice, but let me say this. Here's how the mil military functions, okay? It's, it's like God and the military, then your family. Because here's what happened. You cannot tell your uncle that I can't show up because my son has a game. But we do that with God. You cannot tell your uncle that I can't show up in Iran because my daddy is sick. But we do that with God. Come on, y'all. Let's be honest here. Let's talk for a while, right? Because here's what our uncle does to us. He forces us to reprioritize our personal life to be a part of that organization. Here's the sad comment. We do it willingly and volitionally for our uncle. But when it comes to God, we have issues. Who is more important? I know it's hard. I love y'all. I tell you this is expensive. And so Jesus shows up on the scene, and he says the same thing. You think that's hard with the military. I'm tougher because I want to be above the military. <laughs> yeah, so it calls for a reprioritization. And hear what he's saying. He's not saying don't love your father and don't love your mother and don't love your brother or your wife and don't love your sister. And he's saying don't love. He's not saying that. He's talking about a reprioritization in that one must come before the other. And since I created you, what God is really saying, and I gave you the breath that you breathe, and I put, give you the activities of your limb, the least you can do is put me first in everything that you're going to do if you're going to be my disciple. So it is expensive and it calls for a reprioritization. So here's what that looks like for me. I've got to check my priorities if I call myself a disciple of Christ. Right? So number one, come on, say reprioritize. Come on, say it again, say reprioritize. You see, I hadn't thought about it like that until I started going through the text because here's what will happen. If I'm pledging to a fraternity or a sorority, here's what it looks like. Sometimes, without even thinking, I put the fraternity or the sorority before God because here's what I said to God. I can't worship you because I'm pledging. <laughs> right? I mean, when you think about how we do our lives, the amount of things that take precedence over God. I'm talking radical discipleship. Let's be honest with ourselves. You guys all right? Tap your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, it'll be okay. Come on, tell them. <laughs> yeah, tell them, tell them. Tell them. <laughs> it'll be okay. He, God loves us and he graces us, okay? It'll be okay. It'll be okay. I thank God for his grace. Okay, now watch the second one. Watch the second one. Here's what he says. Here's what he says, okay? In verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. Say, I must bear my cross. One more time, say, I must bear my cross. Here's what that says. Number two, radical discipleship calls for me making public confessions when following Christ. This is very simple. Here's what it looks like. When he says bear the cross, here's what that meant in Roman culture. Because understand, Jesus was not speaking to 21st century believers. He was speaking to individuals at a particular space and time that could identify with what he was saying. So here's how, here's what he was really saying, and here's what the recipients heard or understood. In Roman culture, during the day of Roman days, when you were to be crucified or you were sentenced to death on a cross, here's what would happen. You would have to pick up your cross and you would have to travel from your place of sentencing and carry that cross in the midst 
of the entire crowd where everyone could see you to the place of crucifixion. Now, here is what carrying the cross was saying to the Roman government. It was saying to them, by virtue of the fact that you have sentenced me, I am guilty and you are innocent. So, my journey with the cross was making a public confession to everyone present that I am guilty and you're innocent. Right? So here's what Jesus is saying, is that if you are going to be my disciple, you too need to make that public confession. Because you remember with me, before the cross was carried, here is what Jesus, here's what, uh, was it Pilate or part of Pilate said to the people when he had Barabbas and he had Jesus. Here's what he said, whom shall I release? Y'all know the story. And here's what the people says, give us Barabbas. And then he says, what should I do with Jesus? Here's what they said. Crucify him because here's what Rome wanted. They wanted Jesus to make a public confession that Rome was right and he was wrong. This is the depth of Calvary. So here's what he did. He who knew no sin became sin. So you and I, so Jesus carried the cross of shame while people were sneering at him and jabbing at him. He made a public confession that I am carrying your sins, even I wish I had somebody in here. Even though I didn't do anything wrong, I am carrying that cross for you. And so here's what Jesus says, if you're going to be my disciple, carry your cross. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Make a public confession of who's right and who's wrong. Amen. And God is sitting up high saying, I gave myself up for you. Come on, right? So, so here's the reason I love this point because it kind of says it this way. There can be no, there, there never is, or need, there's no such thing as a secret disciple. Yeah, yeah. Secret agent, double agent, triple agent. <laughs> no, 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 no. Wherever you show up, folk ought to see your cross because you're representing Christ. There's no such thing as laying your religion down for a little while. It doesn't matter how angry you get. It doesn't matter what the situation or circumstance. Whoever we engage, they ought to see our cross because God is right and we are wrong. They ought to see it. But here's what we do. In church, we're cool carrying it. Because up in here, everybody has a cross. When we go out the doors, we don't want our neighbors to see. Come on, y'all. That we've got a cross to bear. Because our behaviors might not have aligned. I wish I had somebody with the cross on our back, right? And we do the same thing on our job. We've been working there for 30 years, and I wonder, do they really know we're cross bearers? Or are we secret disciples? There is no such thing, Jesus is saying. If you're going to be a, a disciple, every, the world must know who you are. And here's the reason the world must know, is the reason I saved you so they can see me in you and ask you, why are you so different? What makes you survive? What makes you make it through? What keeps you going? And you can say, I have taken up my cross and I am a disciple for Christ. Yeah, yeah. Heck, here's how the military does it. When you join the military, and you in basic training, and you graduated, they send you home, they put that neatly pressed uniform on you, they put that hat on your head, depending on your rank, a clean shoulder, a bar, or whatever it is, they send you home, and you go home, I'm a disciple. And here's what your parents say, I'm so proud of you, Billy. <laughs> they ought to say the same thing about us, because I'm a member of God's army. Come on, does that make sense? I'm a member. Yeah. So listen to this. You ought to be able to look at my uniform, my external, because you can't see under the uniform. That's why Scripture says man looks at the outward appearance. I wish I had somebody in here. But God looks where? So you ought to see my uniform and know which army I belong to. Come on, does this make sense? 
So there's no such thing as secret disciples. Let me hurry on. Look at the next thing real quick. Look at the next thing he says here in verse 28. For which one of you desiring to build a tower, he says, does not first sit down and count the, count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he had laid a foundation, he's not able to finish. And he says, all who sees it begins to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Here, 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 let me just put this point up here, and we'll talk through it. I want you all to see this. Radical discipleship, it calls for us counting the cost prior to making the public commitment. I've been saying this all day long. Here's a parable. Don't start building a house and then don't have money to finish it. Nice statement. The problem is we started building without looking in our bank account. So we've signed up not knowing how expensive it is. Y'all remember the rich young ruler? He said, Lord, what must I do to follow you? And Jesus says, keep the commandments and love your neighbor as yourself. Love the love of your God with all your heart. And here's what he says. I've been doing that since I was a child, right? Easy stuff. So here's what discipleship looks like to us. We come to church. The message is given. And the preacher says, the doors of the church are open by letter baptism or Christian experience. And come meet Jesus. And you say, I can do that. I want to meet him. Okay? But then after you've met him, you find out that he says, Go sell all that you have and come follow me. And here's what a lot of us do. Like the rich young ruler, we go away sad. And we try to follow from a distance without the commitment. Right? Here's God's grace. He loves us wherever we are as long as we're on a journey. But his goal is to eventually stop us from following from a distance and come close to the fire so we can look like him. That's why we're having this dialogue, so we can look like him. You kind of get what I'm saying? What Uncle Sam would do, if you don't look like him after basic training, heck, let me go here. If you don't look like him during basic training, he'll kick you out. I thank God that he didn't kick me out during basic training. I know I'm not speaking for myself, y'all, that there's others here that'll thank God that, heck, you've been on your permanent duty station and you thank God he hadn't thrown you out. It's expensive. Come on, say it's expensive. Say it again, say it's expensive. Look at the last thing and then we're going to pray. Come on, worship team. Here's the last thing. He says this, and he puts it this way. Or what king... Going out to encounter another king, verse 31, will not sit down first and then deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, he says, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Here is the last thing I want you all to take away. Radical discipleship calls for surrendering all to Christ. Here's a parable. What king, if he's about to go to war, doesn't sit down and say, how big is my army? And then if he has 10,000 in his army, and then he noticed the opposing king has 20,000 in his army, and that it's a losing battle, here's what he does. He sends a delegation or representative to the opposing king, and he says to him, can we work this out? Or do we surrender? Can I surrender it all so we don't engage in this conflict, in this battle? Here's a principle of the, of the text. The Lord's army is a lot bigger than my individual army. Come on, y'all. If I am going to be a disciple, I need to surrender it all to him. Come on. Because he's bigger than me. He has more than me. I am called to follow him, not him follow me. Now, here's my personal testimony. Along the journey, I have not been honest with myself in surrendering all to him. There are some things I didn't trust him to handle for me. 
Come on, y'all. And I try to do it myself. And I think if you're honest with yourself, some of us are like that. As opposed to giving it all to Him, we figure we can do it ourselves. It's the losing battle. It's the losing battle. So here's my call this morning. Let's begin this process of radical discipleship, discipleship by making the decision to follow Jesus. Does that make sense? By making the decision to surrender it all to Him and to just give it to Him. He's greater, He's bigger, He's all of that. And He wants to provide, He wants to take care, He wants to do it all for us, but we must get to the place where we make the decision to follow Christ. Does that make sense to you all? Come on, stand to your feet this morning. And if God is speaking to you this morning, I want to just take a moment. This word, as simple and as short as it is, has been extremely convicting to me. And I'm going to speak to me before I speak to you. I'm learning when Felix does his own introspection and self-evaluation, he really hadn't sold out to God the way I should have. And I said to you all in the upcoming weeks, we're going to clean this all up because I'm not talking about holy roller, all that. I want you all to get this. But I really have to assess if God is first in my life, if I have reprioritized everything. Come on. If I am willing to make always make public confessions. If I'm willing to carry my cross, to surrender it all, to allow him to be God in my life. So I've made the decision that I'm going to follow him. I want to invite you with me this morning to make the same decision this morning to become a devoted follower of Christ. Radical discipleship. Is God talking to you this morning?